All right. Well, hello and welcome back, everybody. We are back in the mix. We're going to start with chapter 13. We're going to talk about shock tonight. So the first thing I want to say to you about shock is we're going to define shock as hypo perfusion. Hypo meaning low, perfusion meaning blood flow. When I'm saying perfusion and blood flow to the body, I'm saying blood flow to cells, to organs, to tissues. Every one of these things needs, <coughs> excuse me, not wrong. Every one of these things needs blood flow so that they can continue to survive. We talked about the cells and their need for constant supply of oxygen, their constant supply of water and sugar to create energy. If the cells go into a state of having no oxygen or they're not receiving blood flow, which carries oxygen, they will become anaerobic. They will produce, produce um, acid and it will be very damaging to the rest of the body system. So when we talk about shock, we're going to talk about the different causes of shock. There are many different ones, and we're going to start going through them piece by piece, one by one, and how and what you can do as an EMTB to treat their, those conditions therein. I'll go ahead and share my screen with you, and we'll kick it off. All right, let me move us down here to the left-hand side. All right, so let's get into it. Shock is defined, as we said earlier, hypoperfusion. Remember, it's low perfusion status. If you're in shock, you're not getting enough of what you need. A lot of people, when they hear shock, they think you've lost a bunch of blood. That is one of many forms of shock. But they all kind of mean the same thing. You're not getting enough blood by various types of reasons. So let's start off saying it's either a pump problem, a volume problem, meaning a fluid problem, or it is a pipe problem. We're going to keep it very simple by saying it's a pump problem, as in the heart's not beating hard enough. It's a pipe problem where the pipes have increased their systemic vascular, um, decreased their systemic vascular resistance, and they have widened up to the point where they're not delivering flow anymore. Or it is a fluid problem. You just do not have enough volume in the tank to reach and meet the demands of your body at all, any time. <clears throat> so shock is defined as inadequate cellular perfusion. At the end of the day, our job is to keep cells alive, to keep cells alive. So any compromise in that perfusion will lead to cell injury or death. Let's take a look at my finger here. If you can see it, another video makes it kind of squirrely looking. Ooh, finger. So what I do with this thing, if I just took a little string and wrapped it around my finger, what would happen? It would turn red, blue, purple, black, and dye eventually, because I would be cutting off supply of blood to the cells in my tissue here. All cells require tissue and blood flow. And if something causes me not to have enough, that same type of um, issue will happen with the rest of my body. So in the early stages of shock, the body will try and maintain what's called homeostasis. If you remember what homeostasis is, you remember it's when the body's trying to maintain the balance. Oh yeah, the balance meaning that it will try and make up for the difference of what's ever happened. Compensation. Compensating means the body's going to do something to try and make sure we're still getting what we need, but it can't do that forever. <clears throat> so let's talk about diffusion. Diffusion being a passive process where molecules move from an area with higher concentration to lower concentration. If you've had your respiratory um, anatomy stuff with Mr. Larry, and you've talked to it with him. We've talked about diffusion, <clears throat> meaning that diffusion takes place in different areas, but the main one we talk about is going to be in the lungs, where we bring oxygen in, and we inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide, and we perform gas exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary bed. This will create, will be caused by diffusion. It passes through that capillary bed, which is a very permeable membrane. It's like, it's, it's through net filtration that this happens, but basically it's thin enough to where gases can go through it. So in comes oxygen, which is delicious and we use for our body, mm, delicious. And then we blow out the CO2. And CO2 is a byproduct of cellular metabolism, meaning as the cells go through their processes, creating energy, they will have a, a like, kind of like a car burning gas. If any of you have tried this, I wouldn't be surprised, but if you go crank your car up and sit in the garage with the door closed, you'll start to smell something, um, the exhaust fumes, then you'll pass out and die. So don't really try this, but that is the off-gassing of the combustion in the engine. So um, think of it like the combustion of the cells as they go through their process. It's like the, you know, the byproduct of that. 
if that makes sense to you. So in cases of poor perfusion or hypo perfusion shock, there is a impairment that has occurred. So carbon dioxide is not being taken out of the tissues and it's staying in there. Carbon dioxide is actually very acidic to our bodies. Carbon dioxide will mix with the water in our systems and our bodies are, you know, between 75 and 80% water, depending on the person. Me, I think one of these bad boys would be. I can't even see it. Let's see the camera. Oh, well. But uh, it mixes with water and forms carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid will travel back to, through your bloodstream to the lungs and you'll blow it out. And it results in sometimes a dangerous buildup of these waste products, which will cause cellular damage. As the more acid builds up in your system, the more cellular damage that can occur. So shock is the state of collapse and failure of our cardiovascular system. There were three big issues we were going to talk about. Pipe problem, where the veins or arteries are not doing what they're supposed to do. Pump problem, where the heart or the engine itself is um, failing. Or a volume problem where we do not have enough fluid in the tank. We're running out of gas. So this would be like me stabbing Sassy, Brian Sassy in our class and letting him bleed out some. And then he would not have enough blood volume to meet his body's metabolic demands. Blood carries oxygen, right? And if his cells are not getting enough oxygen, they will become anaerobic and he'll produce acid instead of energy. And that's about as simplistic form as I can make it. So, our job is early recognition, and that will save lives. One of the things I'm going to talk about here in a few weeks when we hit trauma is um, talking to you all about maybe becoming Stop the Bleed instructors. I work in the city of Atlanta, and it's very prevalent to have a possible stabbing or shooting go on. I, uh, a sad thing to say, but I work a shooting at least once a weekend, sometimes way more than that, depending on what was going on in town that weekend. But... A couple, couple months ago, there was a couple of um, Asian spa workers that went to work that morning, and they uh, didn't have any idea some gun would go walk in there and start shooting people up. But if people had recognized that the ones that were shot were in shock and had known how to stop the bleeding and stop the bleed, they could have saved many lives. Now, your job as an EMT is to recognize that a person's in shock and act upon it quickly. Act upon it quickly. It requires immediate recognition and rapid treatment. I'm talking about rapid. One of the things you'll hear me say a lot, especially when we hit trauma, is that trauma is a surgical disease. We have to remember that EMS, we do save lives. We rescue people. And it's, it's great. I mean, I love it. But when it comes to EMS, um, I heard this from Kelly Grayson, and I've kept it, so I'll give him credit for it. But basically, we're the special teams of the life-saving world which means in football, the special team's job is they sometimes kick field goals, yes. Sometimes they'll do a fake and they'll throw a touchdown. But for the main part, they punt the ball. And that gives the offense, which is the ER, ball placement. It gives them ball placement and field position. Our job sometimes is to give the patient field position. We have to recognize and then rapidly treat. So we have those three parts I've been talking about. Cardiovascular systems consists of the pump, the heart, the pipes, blood vessels or arteries, and the contents of those things, which are the blood, the blood that's in there. And if you remember me telling you um, in previous week's lectures that the blood has all kinds of components in there. One of the main components of blood is that it's got plasma. Plasma as in the fluid component of blood. It's a kind of yellowish, clear, straw colored fluid. And it's the blood, it's the water component of blood. About 55% of your blood is plasma, just the liquid juice. Oh, yeah. And about 45% of your blood volume is red blood cells. And then about 1% of your blood volume is white blood cells, basophils, and all the other crap, platelets, things like that. Those are very small organisms, or, excuse me, um, things that go in your body. So we have three things that have to be working at all times. The pump has to be working. The pump is the engine. The pipes blood vessels and arteries, and the contents. So we need all three to not be in shock. Here's a good picture that consists of these guys working together, right? So we got the pump in the middle, 
the pipes over here doing their thing, you know, pumping blood in and out, in and out. And then, of course, we need that blood volume to be circulated by the heart. And you guys may or may not remember the pathway of blood through the heart, but I think I may just add it to your quiz this week in case y'all forgot. You're going to learn that. God bless it. I have to do it every week. Learn it. So we have a perfusion triangle that must be in working order. When a patient's in shock, one or more of these three basic parts is not working. We've talked about the heart being the pump, the engine, the blood vessel, the container, um, and the blood content, if there's got to be enough blood. So let's talk about it. Damage to the heart by disease or injury. Well, let's talk about it. disease like a heart attack. When we have a heart attack, remember the finger? If I tie a string around my finger, it'll turn red, blue, purple, black, and die off. The heart itself requires blood flow to survive. It is organic tissue. It is fed blood flow by the coronary arteries. Sometimes if you have a diet of McDonald's and KFC and have a sedentary life, like you don't do anything but sit on your butt and teach paramedic students, <clears throat> and EMT students like moi, then you could develop some coronary artery disease. So that means that the heart will then sometimes have a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. That's the fancy medical word for heart attack is myocardial infarction. It will infarct. So the heart itself can be damaged by that or it can be damaged by a true traumatic physical event. So it has to be functioning to support perfusion. If the heart's not pumping, we die. Any questions about that? No? Oh, that was pretty good. Easy one. All right, the blood vessels, the container functions. Your blood vessels um, operate off of kind of a pressure system. If I can keep it simple, it's like if I had a water hose and I had a target that I wanted to hit across the room. I just cut on that old garden hose, right? Because the hose has a very wide mouth diameter, it's going to come out at a low pressure and kind of just spit out on the floor, right? Everybody's turned on a water hose and it just didn't go very far. It's just a big, thick, wide, you know, stream of fluid coming out. But if I put my finger on the end of that hose and narrow the diameter of it, I can increase the pressure and right, and I can shoot it across the, the room to the target I have. So, the, the blood vessels work kind of similar to that. They have to have a certain diameter to meet the certain pressure requirements that are necessary to meet the organs and cells and tissues perfusion needs. If the blood pressure is too low or if the container is too big, then we're gonna have some issues meeting our end organ perfusion needs. And then blood. Blood carries oxygen. Your red blood cells carry oxygen via the hemoglobin. So if I stab Alex Harp or Ron for making like I don't know, an 80 on their quiz, if I stab them for that and they bleed, there's not enough blood in there to carry oxygen. They will become shocky. They will go into hypoperfusion. Remember shock, it's hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion is shock. Hypo meaning low, perfusion meaning blood flow. So blood pressure is necessary to, okay, I won't. I was just kidding, Alex. I'm not going to stab you unless you fail a test or something. So blood pressure is the pressure of the blood within the vessels at any moment in time. Remember, systolic is the top, that, the top number. Diastolic is the bottom number. When we think of systolic, we need to think of the amount of pressure exerted against the arterial walls by the left ventricle. So how hard is the heart beating and pushing against that wall as it comes out of the heart? And diastolic would be that refilling pressure of sorts the pressure inside of the heart as it refills with fluid. So we need a blood pressure of a, a certain amount of blood pressure to reach end organ perfusion. I talked about the garden hose and, and that, that goes along with blood pressure. The pressure inside the system, the tank here, has to be a certain level for me to meet this organ perfusion that I have. Now, one of the best ways to measure in organ perfusion is a MAP, which is mean arterial pressure, which we'll get into later. But the systolic and the diastolic have to be a certain amount number for us to meet that. So somebody has to have a certain blood pressure to even stay conscious. Does that make sense? If your blood pressure drops, you will go unconscious because you don't have enough blood flow to your brain. 10 seconds without blood flow and you're, you will be unconscious. Without blood flow to your brain, you're unconscious. So now pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. 
That will signify the amount of force the heart generates with each contraction. A pulse pressure less than 25 may be seen in patients with shock. So let's say we got a 120 over 80 blood pressure, right? That means the pulse pressure is the difference in those two numbers, right? That is the difference between those two numbers. Can anybody tell me off the top of their head what that number would be? 120 minus 80 would be 40. We have a difference of 40. So as the patient goes into shock, their pulse pressure will increase. Also, this is a test question. I remember putting it on your study guide, which I painstakingly wrote. So let's talk some more about blood flow through capillary beds. Capillary beds have sphincters, right? They open and close as needed. And blood flow through those capillary beds is regulated by those capillary sphincters, letting things in and out. Under the control of the autonomic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system consists of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. That is your feed and breed system and your fight or flight system. So feed and breed would be your parasympathetic nervous system. That, does, that does, goes along with all your vegetative functions like eating, sleeping, making love, oh yeah. So those systems are regulated by the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight, that is literally what it is. That's kind of like your adrenaline system. That fight or flight, you're either gonna fight, or you're gonna run away, but you're gonna have that big energy spike, all that adrenaline is gonna hit you and you're like, oh yeah, brother, snap into a slim gym. And then you'll either run away or you'll, you know, do a flying elbow like Randy the Macho Man Savage used to do. Oh, yeah. So that is where that's coming from. That is these capillary sphincters are under control of that autonomic nervous system. And you need to think of these two systems working antagonistically against each other, which means they're always button heads. They're always pulling against each other. And, but, and by them doing that, that's how they maintain homeostasis. You can't let the sympathetic nervous system work too hard or be in control because it will constrict the vessels down to nothing. You can't let the parasympathetic nervous system be in complete control. It will just vasodilate and blow all your system up. So the pressure in the whole tank will fall. So they work antagonistically together. Fusion will also require oxygen exchange in the lungs. So, you know, breathing's a good thing, right? <laughs> you ain't breathing, you are you know, in bad shape. So oxygen exchange in the lungs, again, occurs between the pulmonary capillary bed and the alveoli. Alveoli are those tiny little sacs at the end of your lungs. Those guys have performed the gas exchange by the process of diffusion. And again, diffusion is, from, is when this um, oxygen flows from an area of higher concentration, lower concentration, we exchange gas I blow out CO2, I breathe in oxygen, that oxygen grabs onto hemoglobin that's a part of my red blood cells and it takes a ride and then that my blood flow just generates it and transports it all over my body, perfusing my tissues. So I need oxygen exchange in the lungs to occur. There are things that can stop that. What would stop that? Well, like a big piece of steak stuck in your trachea, that would stop it. Or me holding you underwater for you know five minutes or so for failing a test. Kidding, mostly. So we also need nutrients in the form of glucose in the blood. Why do I need glucose? Sugar means energy. Sugar means energy. We need energy, at least I do. And waste removal is primarily done through your lungs. What waste? Well, we talked about the cellular process and that cell, cellular metabolism, right? It produces CO2. We remove CO2 by breathing it out, mm, be gone. So what mechanisms are in place to help support the respiratory and cardiovascular system when the need for perfusion of vital organs is increased? So we have mechanisms to help this when we um, go into a shock position. This includes the autonomic nervous system and hormones. So, uh, if we had a stress response right now and we were all on scene of a, I don't know, we were at the baseball game and somebody just suddenly comes in there and starts shooting people, you would have a stress response, right? Your, your adrenaline would kick up and you'd, you'd feel like really a surge of, of energy and you'd run away, right? 
That is your autonomic nervous system, your sympathetic nervous system, your adrenaline or epinephrine will be released or your norepinephrine will be released. And it would really kickstart a lot of powerful systems in your body. So these org organ systems and these nervous systems and hormones are designed to have desired effects when you're in a stress response. So again, if I stab uh, Sassy for failing one of my tests and he starts to bleed out, initially what will happen, his body will compensate for that blood loss. He's got less blood, but his heart, will just, heart rate will jump, jump up to beat harder and faster to make sure that he is still meeting those in-organ perfusion needs. Because remember, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate times stroke volume. So if, I'm, if I've lost volume of fluid, the heart rate will kick up in, in an attempt to meet in-organ perfusion needs. So the hormones that are released by, these autonom by the autonomic nervous system will be things like epinephrine, which is adrenaline, norepinephrine. Things like that will be kicked out and released. So these hormones are triggered when the body senses pressure falling. This will cause an increase in heart rate, strength of contractions, and peripheral vasoconstriction. So what will happen in the shock response is what? The first thing that's going to happen is your body's going to release adrenaline, and these hormones are going to trigger you to like, get really amped up like you just did a line of cocaine, slash an energy drink, and maybe a, a bang or a Red Bull together, and a Jaeger. That sounds pretty good, actually. <laughs> so that, that body system will release this epinephrine, this adrenaline, to try and save you, to try and compensate for you being in a now shock response. It will increase your heart rate to try and maintain your blood pressure. It will make that heart start to beat harder. The contractions will come harder. And the peripheral vasoconstriction will cause what? The main things we got to keep alive are the heart, excuse me, heart, brain, lungs. <coughs> Not wrong. Heart, brain, lungs. So what will happen is that peripheral vasoconstriction is that my, my, my tissues and my hands and arms and feet and stuff, while it's important, it's not as important as my heart, brain, and lungs, right? So they will vasoconstrict to the point where my skin will become pale, cool, clammy, and even I might even start sweating because I am now shunting blood to vital organs. I'm now shooting all the good blood I got in the outside to the middle to try and save myself. That is why patients that are in a shock are pale, cool, and clammy. And that is why that's one of the number one first signs of shock that we look for when we're doing assessments of patients. You all right, buddy? Oh, I don't feel so good. Oh, let me check your pulse. Ooh, you're kind of cold, buddy. So it'll be a shock response. And that is also another thing that registry wants you to recognize. That is a huge buzzword for National Registry is that pale, cool, clammy. That is supposed to clue you in, the EMT student, that this patient that you're working on or with is in shock. So increased heart rate. So I get there, their heart rate's through the roof. Feels like their heart's just beating out of their chest because that contraction strength is just pounding out. And they're pale, cool, clammy because of that vasoconstriction. This is all a response to the symptoms of shock. So as I've said before, and I'll say again until it's driven home. Remember, I work off of uh, um, spaced repetition concept. You can look this up, but it's a teach teaching methodology that is, I repeat big, important concepts a lot. That way, I hopefully you pick them up by like the fifth time. So we got three basic causes of shock. The heart slash pump is failing. The vessels, the pipes suck or they're not working. Or I've got low fluid. You're low on oil. Ain't got no gas in it. So we got low fluid volume being the problem. So pump failure, let's take a look at this guy. I'm gonna get my little magic marker out. Uh, get you out of the way, fella. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at this fella on the top right here first. So the pump problem causes a heart attack, trauma, heart obstructive causes like a large pulmonary embolus or a, let's say, pericardial tamponade a pericardial tamponade is a uh, there's a sac around the heart called the pericardial sac and a patient that's had a bad heart trauma event like let's say you ain't wearing your seatbelt and you hit a tree and 
you fly forward and hit that steering wheel, it can rupture those vessels in your heart and that bleeding will go into that sac around your heart. Now that sac will get filled with fluid and it'll start to compress and crush your little heart. It will impede it from um, working. It's a form of cardiogenic shock, but it's a also obstructive shock. This is a true form of obstructive shock. So the pump failure, meaning the tank, excuse me, the engine is no longer working because of heart attack or trauma to the heart itself. Now let's talk about low fluid volume. Ain't got no gas in it. Mm -hmm. So this can be caused by trauma to the vessels, but this is called the hypo, if I can write it. Hypo meaning low. Ah, I'm terrible at writing. Oh, well. Hypovolemic shock, hypovolume shock. It ain't got enough volume. Now, most people automatically think it's because you've lost blood flow. And that's not always the case. You can go into hypovolemic shock from fluid loss, from over sweating, from vomiting and diarrhea. A call we run a lot is a dehydrated baby that's been pooping and peeing all day but has not been able to take a bottle. They're dehydrated and they can be in hypovolemic shock. And that happened to you too? Yeah. If you can't stop going to the bathroom and you can't put anything down, that, that's emergency. You can be in hypovolemic shock and not even know it. It's not always blood loss. It is fluid loss too, because as we lose fluid, remember there's a plasma fluid component to your blood volume, right? About 55% of your body's blood is fluid. And if we're losing big volumes of fluid, we can go into shock pretty easily. Now, what about this poor vessel function? So basically what happens here is we have something that vasodilates the arteries and veins. So let's take a look at this little picture I'm gonna draw. I'm a terrible artist, but y'all just hang with me. All right, so that right there is a normal vessel. Let's say that's 120 over 80. Oh yeah. All right, and there's my fluid volume right there. You like it? Gosh, I should be the next Picasso. So something is causing a reaction in the bloodstream to vasodilate or blow up the veins. So the volume is still the same, but because the pipes are way bigger, our pressure, the pressure, the system's pressure will drop dramatically. So this guy right here is 120 over 80, but let's say you're, you're stung by a bee. Your body will then release um, antibodies called IgE that will degranulate the uh, mast cells and the basophils, and it will release histamine. That histamine will cause your veins and, and uh, arteries to vasodilate, and it will drop your pressure, and you'll have low systemic perfusion. Let's see. So this guy's been stung by a bee. Whoa. Look at his pipes now. You think he's going to have the same pressure in this system as he is in this one? No, because the volume is the same. He's still got the same amount of blood and fluid in him. This is your guy that's like 80 over 40. So things like anaphylactic shock or <clears throat> septic shock, where you have an infection in your blood or a spinal cord shock. These are the big space shocks. These are your distributive style shocks. And these again will cause massive vasodilation, blowing the veins up way bigger than they're supposed to be by some form or fashion, and it will drop the blood pressure. Remember I told you earlier, you have to have a certain amount of pressure in your system to meet the end organ perfusion needs. So if I have poor pressure, I can't have proper perfusion. I like it. I like it. Let me erase my little stuff and we'll keep on moving. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's talk about some possible causes here. All right, so the types of causes we've got, pump failure. The heart failing itself is called cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is when the pump fails. This is the fancy medical way of saying it, okay? Cardiogenic. It's cardio, heart, genic in nature, right? So it's because of the heart. We got that plus obstructive shock being a form of pump failure. So we have tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and pulmonary embolism. The three obstructive shocks are tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, 
and pulmonary embolism. If I, let's say Sassy's going to try and score on me in the basketball hoop, as he tries to go up and do a little layup, I will place my hand in front of the ball and obstruct it, and it will go nowhere. I will scream in victory. Not in my house. No. I have obstructed him from scoring. <laughs> so obstruction means a block in the road, right? So obstructive shock means something is physically blocking the heart from doing its job, obstructing it. So we talked about a cardiac tamponade. Let's review. The sac around the heart, the pericardial sac, is filling with blood or some type of fluid, right? And it's compressing the heart. It's squishing it. It's causing more pressure on it. So it's harder for the heart to expand and contract because the sac is putting pressure on it. That is obstructive shock all day. And the blood pressure <clears throat> will fall because it cannot pump adequately to squirt out enough blood to reach the blood pressure we need. Do you feel me? Let's talk about a team tension pneumothorax. You'll cover more about this in respiratory emergencies later this week with Mr. Larry, but a tension pneumothorax is when there is air trapped in the side of your chest. And that air, as you breathe more and more in, you've got a popped lung and that pressure is building and building and building and suddenly it starts to push on your heart and the great vessels located in your chest right here, okay? That pressure starts pushing everything this way. Do you think all that pressure would cause an obstructive shock? It would because the heart's under now great pressure and it can't expand and contract as well as it would have. Now, what other kind of form of obstructive shock are we talking about? Pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary emblem, embolism. So let's talk about emboli versus thrombo, thrombus or throm, emboli. Yeah, that. So a thrombus versus an emboli. That's what I wanted to say. A thrombus is a clot that forms in a specific area and it stays there. An emboli embarks. Emboli embark. They travel. So let's say you got a clot in your leg. Let's say you're an 80 year old woman. You go for a flight and you fly for 12 hours. You don't get up and move around. You're just sitting there. A clot forms in your leg. When you stand up, that clot will move and travel. Emboli embark on journeys and they travel to places they ain't supposed to be. When that fat clot or whatever it is travels somewhere, it can either go in the brain, the heart, the lungs. Whatever it goes, it's going to obstruct something. And when it obstructs, it stops blood flow to something. So that pulmonary emboli will go to your lungs and form a clot there. And it will obstruct the heart from getting blood flow. Everybody with me? Cool. I love it. Now, poor vessel function. We've already talked about this a little bit. Let's continue. Distributive shock is that big space shock, that big old vein shock. We've got septic shock where you have bacteria in your blood. Neurogenic shock where you've had a spinal injury where you lose sympathetic tone, which means, remember I told you earlier, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system work antagonistically all together with each other all day. So with that happening, they keep the, the vessels at a certain diameter so you can have a certain pressure in the body, right? When you sever your spinal column and have a spinal shock go on or a neurogenic shock, boom, the sympathetic nervous system is broken off. You now have loss of sympathetic tone. So the guy that tightens your vessels, he gone. He gone, baby. He out. So all you've got left is the parasympathetic nervous system. And all he knows how to do is blow things up. So that's why you'd have a big space shock and that blood pressure would fall and in organ perfusion would fall and it would be a failure. And somebody's got a question in the chat. By the way, I just gotta say, I'm appreciating them. You, you like my shades? They are cool. No, I just felt like playing. I was playing with it before y'all got on. I just, I can't figure out how to take it off now. <laughs> I'm gonna play with them and get them off. <clears throat> Where's that? I like your shades too, little picture man. Oh yeah, so anaphylactic shock. I already spoke about that a little bit. That's when like a bee stings you or you're allergic to peanuts or something like that. Your body will have an oversensitized immune response and be like, what are you doing in my house? And it will set off. It will release that, them antigens and degranulate the mast cells. And of course that histamine will release and you'll have a full blown allergic reaction. Now, when we get to allergic reactions, we'll talk more about this, but there's a big difference in allergic reaction anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. Remember, shock is hypoperfusion. 
I can be stung by a bee and have a localized reaction. Like he stings me on the finger. Oh no, it turned red and it's kind of painful. And uh, it swells up a little bit. That's localized. When I have anaphylaxis, that means I got a couple more body systems involved. I feel my throat closing up. I'm wheezing. My chest is wheezing. Oh, I got diarrhea. I got, you know, hives and I've got itching everywhere. I'm having all these symptoms. That's anaphylaxis. When that blood pressure falls, when that, those histamine, that histamine release causes that vasodilation in the system, that is when we're in shock. Remember, shock is hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion is shock. Then we got psychogenic shock. This is where, I hate this one. There's two schools of thought on this. Um, but psychogenic shock, you can scare somebody bad enough where they go, <gasps> and they pass out. Right. This is psychogenic. This is, you know, that type of shock where, you know, you know, you're, you're freaked out enough to where you cause yourself to go into a shock response. That's what that one is. And then of course, we got low fluid volume, the hypovolemic shock, that hemorrhagic shock. And then there's non-hemorrhagic shock. Again, you ain't got to be bleeding out to be losing fluid. You ain't. There's this drug called magnesium citrate that if I gave you, you would lose every bit of fluid in your guts you ever thought of having. I'm talking about wicked diarrhea. They give it to patients that are impacted and are constipated. It'll change your life. It's a cardiogenic shock. The pump, he ain't working. Pump ain't working. Causes a major effect in the back of, back of a blood and pulmonary vessels. So let's think about the path of blood through the heart. Left ventricle pumps that blood out of the aortic valve, and it's supposed to go out into the rest of the body. Let's say the left ventricle sucks because he had a bad heart attack and that left ventricle is weak and all sissified. So if he's too weak to pump all the blood in the left ventricle out, where's it gonna go? Right, it's gonna back up back into the lungs. It's gonna shoot back up into the lungs and that patient could develop what's called a pulmonary edema. A pulmonary edema that would be then a patient sort of like drowning in their own fluids because the blood cannot be adequately pumped out of their heart by this crappy, engine they got. Now, again, it can be caused by trauma. It can be caused by, again, a MI or myocardial infarction, but dead meat don't beat. Dead meat don't beat. And whenever you have a myocardial infarction, if you don't get help quick enough, there will be dead tissue in there. And that dead tissue can result in congestive heart failure. And that then can turn to cardiogenic shock. Now, people can live with congestive heart failure. They do it all the time. But when it gets to that point where the heart is no longer beating adequately, it will go into shock. When's it shock? It could be just CHF exacerbation. When is it shock? Is when the heart is no longer meeting the in organ perfusion needs. It is now the blood pressure has dropped. The blood pressure drops. Now we're in shock because that is hypoperfusion. So shock is hypoperfusion. Hypoperfusion is shock. When the heart is not meeting metabolic demand and the blood pressure falls, we are now in cardiogenic. And because of that, we could have a lot of fluid back up into the lungs. Can you breathe through water? I have not mastered it yet, personally. I have not mastered breathing through water yet. So if that's the case, um, then we've got a big problem. Cannot breathe through water. Can't do. So cardiogenic shock develops when the heart cannot maintain sufficient output. So cardiac output depends on adequate contractility of the muscle, the amount of blood to pump, and the resistance to flow in the peripheral circulation. So cardiac output is, again, heart rate times stroke volume. Contractility matters. The heart's very, think of it like a rubber band. This goes into Starlin's law, which I won't dig into much. Basically, if I stretch a rubber band farther and farther, it hits harder, right? The farther I stretch, the harder it hits. The heart's just like that. It's an elastic muscle. So the heart has to have that contractility. Will dead meat beat? Nay, says I. Nay, it will not. So we also have to have the right amount of blood to pump. Blood has to return to the heart. That is your preload. Preload as in we're going to refill the tank before we pump something else out, right? So if we don't have any blood returning back to the heart because I stabbed you for filling a test, that could be a problem to you. 
Also, we need this, the systemic vascular resistance. We need that afterload. Afterload is the pressure in which the heart must pump against. So we need that resistance to flow in peripheral circulation. We need that resistance. We got to have an adequate pressure to meet in organ perfusion needs. Now the obstructive shock we talked about, that's a mechanical obstruction that prevents an adequate volume of blood filling my heart chambers, bruh. So I need adequate volume, but something mechanical is in my way. Let's review them again. Cardiac tamponade, the pericardial sac, the sac around the heart is filled with blood or fluid. This can be because of an obstruction or like, let's excuse me, I mean a trauma, or it can be because of a, you know, something in there popped or blew off or whatever. But that is a tamponade. The sac fills the fluid, squishes the heart, and impairs it from doing what it got to do. Tension pneumothorax, again, is that pressure. We have a popped lung, basically. A pneumothorax is pneumo meaning air. You ever heard of a pneumatic air gun? Pneumo means air. Thorax means chest. Pneumo, air, air in the chest. The air is trapped in the chest. That chest air will start to build as you take more breaths and build and build, and it puts more pressure on the great vessels in the heart, and it is an obstructive form of shock. Pulmonary embolism, a clot that has traveled through the heart and lungs. It's traveled to the lungs, and it's blocked it. All right, so there's tamponade right there. We just talked about that, and I'm not going to beat this dead horse much more. I'm thinking maybe you're starting to get it. Collection of fluid pericardial sac. Comes large enough to prevent ventricles from filling with blood caused by blunt or penetrating trauma. So if I hit you in the chest with a bat or if I stab you in the chest, if I hit the right area, it'll bleed into that sac. The signs and symptoms of a cardiac tamponade, you might want to write this down. It's called Beck's triad. Beck's triad is when you have JVD. So JVD stands for jugular venous distension. All right. So if you've got the heart sac filling with fluid, right, and it's compressing the heart, it'll increase the venous pressure system, right? And the, the, the jugulars you have over here, your external jugulars, they will stand up. like Man, it'll be like a dang finger, man. It'll stand up like this. It will be huge. It'll be bulging out because the heart's under so much pressure. You can see that back pressure start to build elsewhere. So JVD is one of the signs of Beck's triad. Now that we're covering Beck's triad, I may um, put it on your next test, just to forewarn you. So Beck's triad is three things, JVD being number one. Number two, muffled heart tones. Muffled heart tones. Why is the heart tones muffled? When you listen to a patient's heart, if that patient's heart is surrounded by fluid, will it not be muffled? If you've ever been in a swimming pool in the summer and you went underwater and you yelled at your friends or something, did it not sound muffled? It's muffled because you're underwater. So when I'm listening to a patient's heart with my stethoscope, I'll hear muffled heart tones. I'll still hear an S1 and an S2, you know, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, but it'll be like it's underwater. Now that's where we get into muffled heart tones. Now that is very big on registry. However, let me just be honest with you, just not the instructor right now, street medic, street medic telling you right now, you better have a good stethoscope if you're going to hear crap like this. If somebody's going to get you a graduation gift for passing your EMT and all that crap, please make it a stethoscope. Because I can tell you right now, working in the city of Atlanta, if I have a bad trauma on Highway 75, I can't hear a God bless it thing. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, uh. Beedle, beedle. There's so much noise, guys that realistically, if you ain't got a good stethoscope, you ain't gonna hear a darn thing. If you've been in the back of an ambulance and it's one of them diesel ones, I mean, sometimes it'll just pick up the diesel um, quivering that's going on. I'm just being honest with you. That's just street medic advice. Get you a real good stethoscope. You're gonna be hearing heart tones and you're gonna be listening to uh, lung sounds, which is very, very important. You need to listen to both, make it a habit. Best way to get, get, get good at hearing heart tones and to get good at listening to lung sounds is to listen to a bunch of normal lung sounds and normal heart tones. It's simple pattern recognition. Once I know what normal sounds like, I know that this sounds abnormal, and that's a notable finding. Number three. 
hypotension. Oh, yeah. What's hypotension? Sassy. Brian Sassy. Tell me what hypotension is. Mm -hmm. Sassy pants. Thought you were going to get away without not talking to me tonight, huh? Talk to me. I miss you. Let's see. High BP, hypotension is, oh, okay, he fixed it, guys. He said low BP. Very good, low blood pressure. Why would the blood pressure be low? Because the heart's being squished. It can't contract and pump out enough, enough blood to meet a good blood pressure. This is a form of obstructive shock. That is your cardiac tamponade. Actually, one of the last trauma calls I ran was a cardiac tamponade. It was sad as heck. I'm not going to hit you with a war story, but I'm just saying it was sad. Maybe one day I'll tell y'all about it. Get my eraser out here. Annotate. Erase. Zoom is such a good platform for this. I mean, that's a free plug for them. I don't care. It is. It just works so well. I mean, it's the best one I've used. I, I used Teams all last year, and it's uh... All right, moving on, guys. Tension pneumothorax caused by damage to lung tissue. Air normally held in the lungs escapes the chest cavity. Lung collapses. Hot goes wheezy. And air applies pressure to the organs, including the heart and great vessels. Pulmonary embolism, a blood clot that blocks the flow of blood through pulmonary vessels. It's a blood clot that blocks the flow of blood through pulmonary vessels. If the lungs ain't getting blood flow, guess what? They're not going to work right. If it's massive, it can result in a complete backup of blood in the right ventricle, leads to catastrophic. Destructive shock and could cause complete pump failure. Bummer. All right, let's distribute some shock. Amen. So distributive shock, as we've covered a few times again, is widespread dilation of small arterioles, small venules, or both. But basically, the vascular system is expanded. And again, the bigger and wider it gets, the lower the pressure will be. And if I don't have a high enough pressure, I cannot meet organ perfusion needs. Tissue perfusion decreases. So the circulating blood volume pools in expanded vascular beds, tissue perfusion decreases. Tissue perfusion decreases. Let's talk about septic shock. Without getting too deep into it, it occurs as a result of severe infections in which toxins are generated by bacteria or by infected body tissues. So let's say a God, any nursing home patient. I always assume patients in the nursing home are septic until proven otherwise because I'm usually right. So I go into the nursing home. This guy is burning up, man. Septic shock has a lot of tall tale signs. Septic shock is the warm shock. Remember I told you shock will make you pale, cool, and clammy? It will, except septic shock. Because of the, the, the toxins in your body, your body will recognize those little bacteria as pyrogens, which means it will create a fever and a temperature. Septic shock is the warm shock. So the patient's showing all the shock signs, but they're very hot to the touch. Oh yeah, they're septic. So this guy in the nursing home, he's got an indwelling Foley catheter, which means they got a uh, plastic tube stuck up his pee pee hole. Bummer, right, bro? So what happens then is that, that this nursing home CNA turd bag doesn't change his Foley like she's supposed to. And I go in there and He's burning up, his blood pressure's on the floor, and his heart rate's through the roof, and he is obviously septic, right? He's barely conscious because his blood pressure's so low, and I'm checking him out. I'm looking for, what, what's going on, bud? And he's not answering me, and I see his Foley. Oh, God. His Foley is full. There's floaties in it, and it's just this deep, dank, dark, yellow piss color, and it's horrible. And again, do you think that there's not bacteria in that man's pee hole? We've introduced a foreign object into his internal environment. Don't you think there was some, even if they cleaned it, there's going to be some type of, you know, foreign bodies on that thing, right? Now it's been sitting there for quite a while and nobody's changed it. Yeah, he's going to be seven. What about the old diabetic that has that big wound on their foot that they won't go get seen about and they can't even feel it because they have neuropathy. They don't even feel the pain down there. That old wound down there starts to get infected. They will become septic. Basically, anytime infections are allowed to generate in your body and that bacteria goes out and it will damage vessel walls. 
it will increase cellular permeability, which means they will leak. Vessel walls leak and they cannot contract well, and those vessels will then dilate. And that dilation causes the blood pressure to fall, which will cause what? In organ perfusion to fall. So there will be hypoperfusion. So hyperperfusion means, that's right, shock. Shocking. Widespread dilation of vessels and a combination of plasma loss to the vessel walls results in shock. Now let's talk about neurogenic shock. I already kind of covered this a little bit. So this is usually the result of a high spinal cord injury. So somewhere up here in the cervical spine area, right? High spinal cord injury. So we have a, a, a broken vertebrae or something here in the spinal cord is damaged. Nerve impulses to those blood vessels below the injury are now blocked. So everything below is now blocked. All vessels cut off from no nerve impulses will dilate, causing the blood to pool. Remember, the sympathetic nervous system is supposed to keep everything tight and right, baby. But he gone. That high spinal cord injury or that spinal cord injury, it cut him off. We have lost sympathetic tone. We have lost sympathetic tone. So because we lose sympathetic tone, he's who keeps everything tight and right. Parasympathetic dominates and we have vasodilation. If we got vasodilation or distributive shock, big space shock, we will have a fall in blood pressure and the patient will hypoperfuse. And hypoperfusion is, you got it, shock, baby. All right, anaphylactic, are oh, you? Yeah. I'm so glad I'm not allergic to seafood because I would just have to take me an EpiPen and eat it anyway. I love these brown. So allergic reaction occurs when a person reacts violently to a substance in which she or he, he or she has been overly sensitized. It means their body's very sensitive to it and it overreacts every time it comes in contact with that foreign antigen. Antigen, let's just say it means protein, any type of foreign protein. So anytime it, you have that protein in, inside yourself, it will then... Um, the body will overact bad. So each subsequent exposure tends to produce a more severe reaction. So the first time you ate carrots, you might have just broke out a little bit. Ooh, dang, face is hot. Ooh, itching. My dog. Next time you may just, your throat may close up. So it's very important to know what you're allergic to and to mitigate those risks. If you or somebody you love has bad allergies, you need to have an EpiPen somewhere near them. EpiPen will save their life because all the effects that are caused by that histamine release, the ones that are dangerous, the Epi does the exact opposite thing. Let's talk about it. Let's say a bee stings you. It releases its venom into your body. Your body's like, ho, 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 who's this? Some foreign bee venom? Hell no. Well, it released the IgE antibodies. That's the one specific for anaphylaxis or allergic reactions. IgE is released. Again, we'll go to the mast cells and degranulate them. Degranulate means to, to tear apart, to break down and to all that. It releases histamine and prostaglandins and a, lot of, and a bunch of other little things. But the main one that's causing the problems is histamine. Histamine causes increased gut motility. So you may have the urge to poop yourself. Histamine will cause extreme vasodilation, which will cause the shock. Pipes will get really big. Histamine will cause bronchoconstriction, so that your lungs, the bronchioles, will start to tighten up, so no air can get through them. And a lot of um, tissue edema will occur. You'll get redness or erythema in, in your body. You could develop hives, which is urticaria, and you'll start to itch, which is called paritis. Itching, which is called paritis. So these things can all occur. And with that tissue edema because the the vein the um, pipes are getting bigger they'll also start to to have some some leakage so with that leakage that fluid that's in the pipes that plasma part it will or fluid part will leak out into other areas one of the main areas it'll go is like you ever seen um hitch that movie hitch where his face is swelled up it'll go to your face or your or the, or the place where it's um where you were stung at or whatever it depends on your body Another place it'll go is your, is your throat here. You'll have what's called laryngeal edema. 
edema means um, interstitial fluid swelling. So that the, the tissues around your throat hole will start to swell and close your throat hole up. This is a very dangerous and deadly type of shot for many reasons, not just because the patient's blood pressure is going to fall, they're gonna be in shock and hyperfuse their organs, but because they are also in danger of losing their airway. Their lungs are closing up, their throat's closing up. This is bad, bad juju. So EpiPen, that's something you as an EMTB can give somebody. You can help them with their EpiPen. And in our lab, drug lab this week, I'm gonna show you how to stab somebody in the leg <clears throat> with an EpiPen, a fake one, not a real one. Don't get excited. You can still pretend it's real and stab them like, that's what I'm gonna do, sassy. I'm gonna do it sassy. So, there's that. So here's just a couple of um, signs and symptoms you could be looking for with these um, different rest, different system. Each system has its own way of um, reacting and there's plenty of signs and symptoms, you know, but the main ones that, you know, we do see are of course, you know, itching, the urtic area or the hives, the tissue swelling and the, um, Vasodilation being a big problem there. So, psychogenic shock caused by a sudden reaction of the nervous system produces temporary generalized vascular dilation resulting in fainting or syncope. That's what we call fainting in the medical world, syncope. A temporary loss of blood flow to the brain and you will be have a syncopal episode and you'll pass out. You ever stood up too fast and kind of felt lightheaded? You were close to a syncopal episode. So it could be life-threatening because it could cause a regular heartbeat and brain aneurysms. Non -life usually a non-life-threatening event, though. It could be because you got bad news or experiencing fear or unpleasant sights. So let's say I, I'm thinking about doing this, honestly, if I can get a hold of it. One of the things that um, Mr. Larry did to my critical care class years ago was he brought pig lungs and a pig heart into the um, classroom. And I really enjoyed it. And... Um, we got to watch the lungs puff up. And I've always tried to include pluck labs like that in every class I teach now. But again, it's hard getting your hands on some and then the cops pull you over. Why are you got all these bloody lungs? Because I'm a serial killer. What do you think? Oh. But um, so if we can do that, I'm going to love to have that lab with you guys. If possible, it'd be pretty fun. So it could be something that non-life threatening. One of you guys could see the side of blood, puke, and then pass out. And then we'll know, you know what? Maybe Walmart needs a greeter. Maybe EMT and ain't for you. So that'd be a good, you know, testing ground for some of y'all. But also, maybe you got some bad news. You know, that kind of thing. Just something like that. Oh, I got a chat bubble. I'm so excited about book labs. I am too. I hope they go through. I hope we can do it. Um, again, we got to get our hands on the stuff. I mean, we got to find a butcher willing to give me, like, you know, deceased animal lungs. We got to be able to keep it cold enough to where it doesn't rot you know there's a, there's a lot to it you know but i really want to do it it's a really fun lab plus you get to watch the lungs expand we can talk about peak um we can talk about a lot of things um, we're going to intubate the lungs and the trachea and we're going to watch them you know, again inflate we'll we'll cut the heart open dissect it all that stuff. again no promises but i'm trying hypovolemic shot hypovolume shock Result of inadequate amount of fluid. Um, no problem, we're gonna try our best. Results of an in inadequate amount of fluid or volume in the circulatory system. Hemorrhagic causes and non-hemorrhagic causes. It can occur with thermal burns. You ever seen somebody get a bad burn and they have that big blister full of fluid? Bad burns can cause a lot of fluid shifting from different spaces and they'll go into spaces they're not meant to be. A bad enough burn, you can go into hypovolemic shock. Bad enough diarrhea, you can go into hypovolemic shock. Bad enough vomiting, you can go into hypovolemic shock. These are things that are possible for shizzle. So now we need to talk about the stages of shock. The stages. There's levels to this game. Oh, yeah. Compensated, decompensated, and irreversible shock. What do you think irreversible means? It means we've reached the point of no return. It is irreversible. There's no coming back for this. You're gone, player. 
compensated and decompensated, there's still hope. So compensated shock is the early form of shock, the first one you'll see, when the body can still compensate for blood loss. So again, let's say I stab sassy in the leg, I stab and twist, I'm a gentleman, and then he starts to bleed, right? And then his body would be what initially? Heart rate goes up, contractility goes up, his respiratory rate increases. His body finds a way to compensate or make up for the now lack of blood he has. As he begins to lose more and more blood, he's lost enough blood now where that's a later stage of shock. He's now decompensating. His body did its best for as long as it could, but now his blood pressure is falling. Blood pressure will now fall. That's how we know he's in decompensated shock. There's no real way to assess when effects of, are irreversible. The main thing that he would need is blood volume. He needs his blood volume replaced at an ER. Um, main thing with shock is to get their perfusion back on track. So let's say it's like septic shock and he's got those bacteria in his blood. He needs antibiotics in either fluids or a presser, something to squish his vessels back and make them tight again, right? If it's, he's lost a lot of blood, he needs blood. Or what you can do as an EM um, or paramedic or EMTs pre hospital you can give them fluids in the meantime, right? So when they get to irreversible though, that means that they're usually pretty set on dead. Sucks for you, you're O-neg, oh, poor sassy. Well, um, I'll miss you. So as long as you've paid your tuition, you know, I don't care. <laughs> but we must recognize and treat shock early. So how do I do that? Me personally, the best way to do this is to have a high index of suspicion. Any trauma patient I run, I assume they're in shock until proven otherwise. I keep that high index of suspicion. I go in there looking for shock. Not that I get tunnel vision and ignore everything else going around me, but I'm looking for the worst possible scenarios and I work backwards from that conclusion. All right, so he doesn't have this going on. Okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? So I'm always looking for shock. You need to be looking for shock. That way, if we can find it, we can treat it and street it. You treat them, you street them, get back out of it. So there's no way to really see a reversible shock, but if that blood pressure's falling, they're losing consciousness and they're really cold and pale, and they're going to be pretty much around irreversible shock. This is a good chart to show some progressive signs of, of shock. There we go, we got the agitation, the anxiety, you know, feeling of restlessness. I would definitely take time to make some of this into memory because one of the first things you'll notice um, about patients in shock is they will be agitated and they won't know why. You'll, you'll think a lot of times because they're pissed off if somebody hit them, but yeah, that could be it. But the agitation, they're super anxious, that feeling of, am I going to die? Am I going to die? I'm really thirsty. They're thirsty because their body is searching for a fluid source to replace what they've lost. They're still compensating right now. Then that decompensated shot, that blood pressure falls below 90 systolic. Systolic is the top number. When that number goes below that, that's when we're kind of calling them high, hypotensive. Mental status decline. They're starting to lose consciousness or be altered, have labored breathing. Their skin is like bluish, pale. You know, bluish skin is called cyanotic, and it does not have enough um, oxygen in it. Ashen, mottled, dilated eyes, that kind of stuff. Blood pressure may be the last measurable factor in a change in shock. When that blood pressure falls, it is evident that shock is well-developed. We need to be able to catch that before it gets that far along. How do you do that? Go in there looking for it. Be aggressive. Be, be aggressive. By that, I mean be aggressive, but be forward. Be thorough. Any trauma patient I get, oh, they get banged. What does bang mean? means they get butt-ass naked in Georgia. We're going to cut their clothes off. I'm looking for injuries. You're not going to embarrass me in this ER me because I didn't find something. Secondly, you're going to what? You're going to be thorough. Head-to-toe systematic assessment. Up to down, down to right. This is what we're going to do. So blood pressure may be that last thing we find. Very true in kids and infants because when that blood pressure drops in them, they're definitely in shock and they're close to death because 
being a smaller human, like a child or an infant, you can compensate longer. Your heart's much younger and healthier, and it can it can compensate longer. But once it falls in a kid, they're usually going towards heaven. They are close to death, so we've got to be very aggressive with them. Also expect shock if a patient has any of the following conditions. Multiple severe fractures. Well, if you've got a bunch of broken bones, those bones have a lot of blood flow to them and in them. Yeah, you're going to have some blood loss. Abdominal or chest injuries, spinal injuries, a severe infection, major heart attack, or anaphylaxis. So how do I deal with these type of things? Well, again, you have to make sure the scene is safe. That is the first number one uno thing we got to do, boo. So if the scene's not safe, remember great elations one nine. Scene's unsafe, thou shalt dippeth out. Amen. Mm. So if the scene's not safe, we dippeth out. I know how hard that is. I get it. I do. I can be right there in the middle of the patient. I don't want to leave her, but if I don't, I'm going to get shot. Um, I read a lot of y'all's discussion posts today about your opinion on whether medics or EMT should carry, you know, and um, I agree and disagree with a lot of that. There was no wrong answer, no wrong answer. But that means that if, if I'm not going to carry, I'm going to have to take extra care not to get hurt, right? So if somebody's coming out all super excited and combative, I may have to dip if there's a big old dog, you know, I may have to dip. Or if there's an electrical line slapping everywhere, I may have to not go in. These are things I've got to look for. So not only do I need to protect myself, but scene size up and scene safety is not a one-time thing. Ladies and gents, it is a repeating thing. I'm constantly evaluating and re-evaluating the scene. My head's on a swivel. I'm always watching. I'm always watching. So I am checking out scene i'm looking for potential hazards at all times we do not run into scenes we walk briskly trying to be efficient as possible but if you do if you run you're gonna fall into a hole ask me how i know we do not run we walk we evaluate we scan and clear scan and clear scan and clear what about wearing gloves and eye protection if there's a lot of bleeding yeah you're gonna want to have gloves on you want somebody bleeding all over you um we don't know what they got we really don't. We don't know what their diseases they're carrying or what. But we just got to be careful to protect ourselves, protect our partners, protect the hospital staff. If I catch something, I could give it to them, and I don't want to be responsible for that. Another thing to look at is the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness, MOI or NOI. Is it trauma or medical? If it's trauma, I look at the mechanism of injury. Let's say, for instance, um, I go to a call, car versus telephone line or pole. I get there and the guy wasn't wearing a seatbelt and his steering wheel is crushed and he's laying across it. And he's just laying across the steering wheel like this. I pull him back. He's like, oh, my chest hurts. I'm going to assume he's got some bad chest trauma going on. As a matter of fact, I've worked a lot of cardiac tamponades that happen just like that. So mechanism of injury gives me clues. I'm assuming that he's got something going on here because his steering wheel's crushed and it was crushed by his chest. The primary assessment, we went over that in lab last week a little bit, and it was really fun, but that's something you'll carry the rest of your life. Your, your primary assessment needs to be lickety split fast. Why? You are looking for life threats. So primary assessment is making sure the scene's safe, PPE, DSI, number of patients, um, mechanism of injury, nature of illness. Do I need additional resources? Well, I consider C-spine, which is that thing we did with the neck to make sure we don't break or hurt anything else, have any kind of further spinal issue. Then we go into general impression. What's the patient doing? Are they laying there? Are they sitting up? What, or what's my general impression of them as I walk up? Then I'll check their LOC, their level of consciousness, by using the AVCU scale. Are they alert? Are they verbal? Hey, buddy, can you hear me? Huh? Oh, yeah. Hey, man, what's up? Welcome in. Come on in. I called y'all. Are they painful? Sir, sir. I'll do a little sternal. <clears throat> and then are they unresponsive? If they're unresponsive, I'm going to check, you know, um, pulses, and I'm going to be look, listening and feeling for, for these things, right? I'm looking for chest rise, listening for breath sounds, and I'm feeling for a carotid pulse. But I have to determine their level of consciousness. Then I will check their airway, their breathing, their circulation. Airway, breathing, circulation. It's always A, B, C. That is the order of importance that we teach you. Airway, breathing, circulation. If you ain't got airway, you won't be breathing, you won't have a circulation. That only changes if they do not have a pulse. ABC becomes CAB 
when they do not have a pulse, when they do not have a pulse. So rapid, ex rapid exam, determine level of consciousness, identify major threats. And after we perform LOC, ABC, after we do C, we determine if the patient's a priority transport. A test question this week. After we perform the primary assessment, that's when we determine patient transport decision. Is it a load and go or a stay and play? Load and go versus stay and play. Now, here's my, th this is a whole different, this is just me personally kind of thing. My years of experience have taught me not to stay and play. What is the good of me sitting here trying to be rescue Randy on scene when I got everything I need in the ambulance and I can do things in route, getting them to the place they need to be gotten to? Tell me that. What is the good? That patient doesn't need me to be spit me rescue Randy. Let's say the guy that we just talked about with the pericardial tamponade. He has been slammed into his steering wheel, crumpled it, and he's injured his chest. His sack, his heart sack, is filling with fluid, and it is compressing his heart, and it's formed an obstructive form of shock. Okay? What can I do for that? Not a dang thing other than support his blood pressure with a fluid administration of every five mLs per kg and rapid transport with two large bore IVs to the hospital while looking for secondary injuries and supporting his LOC and ABC. That is it. He needs a ER. He needs a doctor to perform a pericardial synthesis where they will insert a needle. All right, they'll insert a needle in this bottom half down here and stab it into that sack and they'll draw out fluid. They will draw out fluid. He needs a pericardial synthesis. So pericardial tamponade needs a pericardial synthesis. It means to draw out. Why would I delay on scene? Let's say dude breaks his leg. Bummer, right? I can splint it to prevent secondary injury. I can make sure he has a pulse in it and an adequate perfusion. I can manage his LOC and ABC. I can even give pain meds. But can I set the bone? Can I put it in a cast? The answer is no. No rescue Randian. Treat your patients and get them where they need to go. Amen. So primary assessment. Provide high flow to assist in perfusion. For hypoperfusion, treat aggressively and provide rapid transport. And if you need ALS, you call ALS. So one of the things that ALS can do for you is they can provide fluids, medications, advanced airway management, pharmacology, electrophysiology, and a lot more pathophys and medical training than the EMTB's got. Also now in Georgia, we do have clinical trial that allows paramedics to give blood products. In the past, we have only given saline or fluid, just, just basically it's pasta water and it's not really a good thing to give patients, but it's the best we could do for many years now. But finally, we're, going, we're giving blood products in a couple of locations. Good thing about giving blood products is what? It has clotting factors. It also can transport oxygen. Normal saline cannot transport oxygen. It's terrible. There's a whole list of reasons. I normally list them in paramedic class. This is EMT class. We won't go there. So for you treating hypoperfusion or shock, it's putting them in shock position, putting a warm blanket over them and lifting their feet in the air. I will show you shock position this week, but basically it is you lay the patient flat on their back, lift their feet six inches, put a warm blanket on them. Hypothermia or being cold affects the clotting system. It'll also affect the patient's rate of deterioration. So give them O2, give them oxygen. Shock position where they're flat and their feet are raised six inches and keep them warm. As an EMTB, you cannot start an IV. You can set one up for your paramedic. And if you need a paramedic, you can always request an ALS unit to come and help you. Now, here's a caveat. I did just tell you not to be rescue Randy, right? If you are five minutes from the hospital and the paramedic unit is 15 minutes away, what is the right choice for the patient? I'll wait for an answer from the peanut gallery I got. 
You definitely should go to the hospital. Let me get a hell yeah. Go to the hospital for 10. All right, 10 points of Gryffindor. I like it. He is right. Go to the hospital. Why would I wait 15 more minutes? He's going to deteriorate more and more and more and go into more and more shock. Bruh, that ain't good. So transport is the option there. Now let's, let's reverse it. It may sometimes be best to have the paramedic unit come, especially if that patient's about to circle the drain and go see Jesus. Jesus. So that's a, a call you, the EMT, have to make. But don't make it out of pride and don't make it out of fear. Don't make these decisions out of pride. Do not make these decisions out of fear. What is best for my patient? Make it out of love. Right. Make these decisions out of love. Your love for that patient and your desire to give them the best care possible. If the best option is letting that paramedic come and take over, then fine. Don't call him or don't call her. Don't call the paramedic because you're scared. Call them because it's the best thing for the patient. And don't sit on scene with your thumb up your butt because you're scared. Handle business. Do what's best for your patient. So next we'd form the general impression. Assess the airway. Is it open and patent? We're looking for signs of patency, which would include what? Is it open and is there air moving in and out? I'm looking for signs of strider. Strider is what? High-pitched crowing or whistling sound coming from the upper airway, this area, upper airway, indicating a partial airway obstruction. That's a test question. Wink, wink. I'm also looking for snoring. The most common airway obstruction is the tongue. The most common airway obstruction is your tongue. And a simple head tilt chin lift, by just moving that patient's head back a little bit, that tongue can fall over and block the airway. So just moving the head back a little bit, it moves the tongue out of the way. What if I hear gurgling? Well, the patient needs to be suctioned if I hear gurgling. Need to hear. Week four is clear. It wasn't that bad. Quit lying. Week four was, I gave you a study guide. Man. So, <laughs> so, what was that? Man, excuse me. All right, so I'm checking for that. Then I'm going to check for breathing. I'm looking not just if their chest is rising. We taught you how to take a, a manual respiratory rate this last week at lab. The U Savannah people will catch you up um, this week or next. I'm, I'm not sure, but whenever we meet, we'll make sure you're squared away. I want you to be good at your job. As I ever visit Savannah, and, which I do sometimes, I need some EMSing. So I'm not just looking for, are they breathing? I want them to be breathing between 12 and 20 times a minute. That is a normal adult respiratory rate. I also need them to be breathing adequately, which means their rate and their depth are normal. They need to be breathing deep enough to, get, to bring air in and blow all the extra air they have in there out. So I'm assessing their, their, the depth, their tidal volume as well. A patient that's breathing shallow needs to be bagged. A BVM, a bag valve mask, needs to be applied. If you are not breathing deep enough, I need to bag you. So an increased respiratory rate is a sign of impending shock. Then we check the patient's skin status, their circulatory status. I'll feel for a pulse. I'm also going to feel their skin color, temperature, and moisture. Skin color, temperature, moisture. These signs are telling me what's going on. Are they pale, cool, clammy, or are they pink, warm, and dry? These things tell me what's going on. Rapid pulse means compensated shock. And in shock, that skin will be pale, cool, clammy, or ashen. And we want to assess for any life threats and treat them right away. The parent determine if the patient's ALS, if is this high priority, is ALS needed, and which facility you're transporting to. So you might remember this from EMS systems, but we have different levels to trauma hospitals. We got level one being the highest trauma designation you can take a patient to, level two, level three, level four. As we get down to level three and four, we're talking about maybe a Band-Aid station to where they may not kill them, they may kill them. But the main thing is any trauma patient that you have that is not like, any trauma patient you have needs to go to the highest trauma hospital you can get them to, preferably a level one trauma hospital. Here in Atlanta, we have two. We have Grady Memorial Hospital and Atlanta Medical Center. As a former Grady employee, um, I, it was the, it's the best trauma hospital in, in, the, in this side of the country. I have taken patients there that I did not think would live, that lived, and it's crazy. However, Atlanta Medical Center has a way better snack room, food for thought. Way better snack room. What you got? It's Kennestone level two. 
I think Kennestone's level two, Mr. Sassy, and I think they're working on their level one designation right now. Last I was told, but they sh it shouldn't be much longer. And they'll be a level one, which would be great for the Cobb area. That way you got to travel all the way to Grady for all of your big trauma needs. All right. So history taken. We talked about history taken a little bit in our assessment module. So when I meet a patient, if they're conscious and able to talk to me, I need to talk to them and find out, hey, Why'd you call 911, bro? What's going on? Tell me about it. So I determined their chief complaint. Oh, bro, my chest is hurting, man. What happened? Well, probably the cocaine I did. Oh. So we've been, we've, we have found in just a few seconds that possibly the cocaine <laughs> has caused his chest pain. Right? Possibly the cocaine has done that. You know what level memorial is? You know, I don't know what level memorial is. I assume that y'all have at least a level one or two in that area. Um, I'm not from Savannah, so I don't know that one. I wish I did, but um, I got a lot of friends that live there. I might can make a phone call and find out. So the difference in the levels is just to keep it simple, like a level one trauma hospital, no matter what I take them, I'm talking about busted skull, broken legs, fractured pelvis, a th the thorax is crushed, pericardial tamponade, whatever I take to a level one trauma center, they got somebody there right now that can fix that problem, lickety split. That's a level one. Level two, it'll have a lot of the same stuff. However, like let's say they won't have neuro actually on site. So they may actually have to call the guy in. It may take him 30 minutes to an hour to get there, depending on where he lives. Level three, of course, will have less of these <coughs> great operative ser um, services. Level four will have almost none of them, if any of them. I think uh, when I worked in Montezuma, Georgia, yeah, down there with the Mennonites. Fantastic place to work. I mean, I'm making fun of them, but they were the best I've ever worked. I mean, I love them. However, there was one hospital in town. It was Flint River Hospital. And it had a doctor or a PA in there every night that was working a 24 hour shift and like two nurses. They had like seven or eight beds. I mean, you didn't you didn't take anything serious to them, which is why a lot of times in rural rural counties like where I'm from, if we had a bad trauma, I would try my best to fly it. It takes me, it took me an hour and 30 minutes to get to Macon, which was my trauma, closest trauma hospital by ground ambulance. So if I'm ground and pounding and I'm going an hour and 30 minutes one way, that also takes a, a whole ambulance out of service for hours. So if I could fly them, the helicopter could meet me and I could make an LZ and they could meet and grab the patient and roll on and be there in 20 minutes. That's better for the patient. So the difference is, you know, what they have available to the patients. Level one's gonna have whatever you need, bro. whatever. That's why if I got, you know, if you got anybody, you're gonna to wanna to take them on to the, the level one. Now, let's say it's just a, a broke toe or something. Yeah, maybe you can take them to level two. You gotta be very careful with that. If you don't know, if you're not sure, perhaps, perhaps we um, call and ask. That's what we'll do. We'll call and ask. All right. So history taken. We got to obtain a sample history. So going into sample history, we're talking about what? Sample stands for signs and symptoms, allergies. Let's just let's just buff it out real quick. So S. Signs. What is a sign? Sign is something you can see. A symptom is something the patient tells me they got going on. So a sign will be like a vital sign. All right, what about the A? A stands for allergies. But why is that important? Well, if I'm going to give them aspirin and they're allergic to aspirin, that could make things worse, right? M stands for medication. What medications are they taking? <clears throat> Have they taken their medication? Are you supposed to take your medication? Why have you not taken your medication? Well, no wonder you got a headache and your blood pressure through the roof. You have not taken your blood pressure medicine in a week. Now we know. What about the P? Past medical history. So you're saying you had a heart attack last year and now you're having um, chest pain today and it feels like the one before? 
Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So then we have the L. L stands for last oral intake. This would be important because maybe the last thing they ate was making them sick. Or maybe they might need surgery really quickly. We need to know if they've got anything on their guts. And then we got E. E stands for the events that led up to this incident. So just a quick refresh for those of you that are going to be watching this later. Sample stands for signs and symptoms, allergies, meds, past medical history, last oral intake, and events. These all are very important. This is part of your history taken. And if you feel the need as you're take, learning about these patients to write sample down and then fill in the crap they tell you about it, then do it. When I was a very young medic, I used to write down sample on, on a piece of paper. And I just, as I asked them, so what's going on today? Okay, not a problem. You got any allergies? Okay, you're allergic to peanuts. Nice. I don't have any on me, so no worries here. Um, what medications do you take? Okay, you take lisinopril. Okay, you got high blood pressure. All right, so just the high blood pressure. What kind of medical history do you have? What's going on with you? High blood pressure. Well, you got the sugars. Oh, the sugars. Well, you didn't tell me about no, no drugs you take for the sugars. Oh, you take shots. Oh, okay. Oh, did you eat anything today? No, you didn't eat anything. What, you take your shot? So you took your insulin, but you didn't eat. No wonder you feel so crappy. Let's check your blood sugar. Dang, it's like 60. You're about to pass out on me. Let's get you something to eat. And legit, <clears throat> not all medicine, guys, is <clears throat> me pushing drugs and stuff. I have literally made a patient a PB&J in their own kitchen. And I've literally made a patient a egg sandwich in their kitchen because that's what they needed for me at the time. Now, is that something we teach in school? Well, what if the supervisor's calling? Hey, man, the supervisor called. What is his delay on scene? Patient care. I am doing patient care right now on this scene. I am making this patient a sandwich. Yes, sir, I am. That's what I'll be doing. So let's erase all this and we'll keep on moving on. Life's a garden. You got to dig it, bro. You're my sister. You're my sister. Sorry, I watched Joe Dirt this afternoon. All right, back to it. Secondary assessment. So primary, right? Primary assessment, we're looking for life threats. Sample history, we're looking for history to get on them. Secondary assessment, we repeat the primary assessment. So I go right back to LOC, ABC, then I do a focused assessment on my patient. If a life-threatening problem is found, we treat it immediately. We get baseline set of vitals here. And the reason I get baseline set of vitals is so I can trend them. If the patient gets worse, I can see their vitals are trending down. I can see they're getting worse. I can see their vitals are getting better. If they're getting better, if they're improving. So reassessment, we want to reassess the patient's vital signs. Any interventions we've done, chief complaint. Hey, man, how's that chest doing? You still having chest pain? No, it's getting better. Awesome. God, good, good. I'm glad to feel that, hear that. ABC and mental status. We're checking it all again. And we're going to keep checking it through the whole time they're with us. Let me tell you something. Patients do not suddenly deteriorate. Healthcare workers are suddenly going to notice. This is because... You're back there Snapchatting your, your, your homegirl and you're sending her butthole pics or something you ain't supposed to be doing while you're at work. So your job is to focus on your patient because the quality of your patient care can affect the quality of this patient's life. Give them your full and undivided attention for 15, 20 minutes or however long your transport is. Stop playing games with these people's lives. Well, what if it's a 1013 and oh my God, you need to watch that 1013. They have something going on with them that has caused them to be in a depressed state where they may have an episode of wanting to kill themselves. They're back there for a reason. I was in operations command one night. I had an employee call me. What had happened was, <laughs> what had happened was, this patient um, was a suicide patient. It was just a 1013 transfer, right? So, the employee, the, the, the employee who will remain nameless for whatever company I was working for, I won't name them or anything. But the, the employee back there took a nap. The patient saw that the employee was napping, reaches behind them, grabs a little bag, finds their phone, 
breaks the phone, takes the glass that the phone case, that the phone outside thing had, and starts to put it in their mouth and swallow it. It cuts their esophagus and their trachea. Patients now starting to gargle blood. Guy wakes up and the patient's These patients need you to pay attention to them. That was complete negligence. Now, luckily, the patient lived and the employee was um, able to survive that onslaught. I don't know how, but that was a big, big deal. Every patient needs your vigilance. Determine what other interventions are needed and focus on supporting the cardiovascular system. So treat for shock early, aggressive. Provide O2, keep the patient warm. As soon as you recognize shock, begin treatment. What can you do? Put them in shock position. Put them a blanket on them. Keep them warm. Follow standard precautions. Control all bleeding. Make sure the patient's airway is open. Make sure they're in manual inline stabilization. Check breathing and pulse. Keep checking vitals. And as soon as you recognize shock, keep trying to calm the patient. It's not always that you've got to do all these big bad things. Sometimes it's putting your hand on a patient. Hey, man, put your hand on their shoulder. Hey, buddy, I'm right here. We're doing everything we can, okay? We got you, buddy. Look at me. Listen to my voice. Do I sound calm? I'm, and when I freak out, you can freak out. So stay with me, okay? Feed off my vibes, okay? So there it is. All right. As soon as you recognize shock, put blankets under and over the patient. Consider the need for ALS. And here's the kicker. A patient that is unstable needs their vital signs checked every five minutes according to registry and all the literature. I, as your instructor, are going to tell you to not take your eyes off of them. I check every two to three minutes. That's a me thing. That's not registry. Nobody will, will call you silly if you say every five minutes because that's the answer. On your written exams and registry stuff, it, every five minutes for an unstable patient. A Josh thing is every two to three minutes because I maybe am a control freak. I don't know. There's a reason for it. But I am very thorough. Every five minutes for a patient in shock or who's unstable. A stable patient every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes. All right. So that's going to wrap us up for our first lecture of the night. I am going to eat dinner and take a small break. Let me go ahead and pause the recording and stop it.